so good to be with you and to be able to worship. What a time of worship, lifting up the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, and so I do uh, thank the Lord for the privilege of coming, and uh, that'll teach them to say, uh, anytime you're out in Las Vegas, give us a call, you can come preach. <laughs> Amen. I called them. I'm coming to Vegas. So I'm coming to preach. Amen. And I'm here with my lovely wife, although she is a uh, bedside Baptist. And she's, uh, she said, oh, you go ahead. I'm tired. I said, okay. And uh, she's my sugar babe. I call her sugar babe. And we've been married for 44 years. Yeah. We praise the name of the Lord. He is good. And uh, so uh, tonight, since she's not with me, I guess I'm sugar free. Amen. And uh, did bring along some books. I trust that you will uh, get them. You know, to get to heaven, you got to have Jesus and my four books. So, <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. And uh, if you have your copy of the scriptures, would you turn to the book of Acts? Acts chapter 1. I'll focus my Simonic spotlight on verse 8 taking the title from uh, the text itself, Be Witnesses. And uh, it's providential. Uh, Pastor Derek is away, and uh, he's preaching through the book of Acts. And uh, when Tony told me, I said, wow, that's the providence of the Lord. Amen. And so Acts chapter 1, verse 8, I'll be using the King James Version of the Bible. I'm a dinosaur. I'm a dinosaur. I know, but since Jesus translated it and passed it out to his disciples, I thought. <laughs> Somebody said, I didn't know that. <laughs> Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, how grateful we are that we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. And so we pray that you'll feed us with the manna from on high, that you would be glorified we as your people would be edified, that the devil would be horrified, his demons terrified. All in the name of Jesus Christ, whom we love and serve. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now you may have heard the apocryphal story uh, about what happened at the zoo. Uh, the gorilla died and he was the main attraction. And uh, so uh, people stopped coming in the droves that they were. So they decided it's going to take us three months to get another one. Let's see if we can find somebody who can imitate a gorilla, give them a, a gorilla suit, and uh, fill in that three months. Well, they found a guy. He was very, very good. As a matter of fact, he was so good uh, that they didn't even really want the real gorilla. Uh, people would gather around the cage, and they wouldn't look at any other animals until finally one day he was showing off. His hands were wet, and he slipped off and fell into the lion's cage. When he fell in, the lions started coming toward him. And then he said, well, maybe if he knows I'm a man, so he tries to pull the, the head off, but the zipper stuck. Lion's coming toward him. So he tries to zip it down from the side, but the zipper stuck. Until finally the lion's right on top of him, roaring, and he says, wait a minute, please don't eat me, Mr. Lion. I'm not a gorilla. I'm really a man in a gorilla suit. Lion said, shut up, fool, or we're both going to lose our jobs. <laughs> uh, now there's meaning to the madness. Uh, uh, because I submit to you that that story tells us this. That many of us pretend to be what we never intend to be. That, that we as believers uh, need to understand uh, that we can't give testimonies. We can't be testifying. Uh, that we're supposed to be testifying. Uh, one Sunday school teacher uh, wanted to show off for the Sunday school superintendent. And when uh, she came in, uh, he said, class, somebody tell the teacher, why do people call me a Christian? Little Johnny raised his hand and said, because they don't know you like we do. <laughs> Vance Havner, uh, the great late revivalist, uh, he said this. He said, 
that Christianity has become so subnormal that when you see normal Christianity, you think it's supranormal. He went on to say, quote, it's getting to be if you want to fellowship with the average Christian, you've got to backslide to do it. Mm. And so we are witnesses. We are witnesses and we witness with life and lip. Life without lip, that's heresy because the redeemed of the Lord ought to. Okay, somebody been reading their Bible. Yeah, but, light, but lip without life. That's hypocrisy. So then we need life and lip because that's honesty. And so we are called to be witnesses. Now, if we had a choice, we had to live it even if we don't lip it. And I know you may not agree with me, but Luke does in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Because he says in this verse, he said, don't worry, I'm going to tell you like uh, Britney Spears told her first husband, I ain't going to keep you long. Here's what he says. He says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. And so the key phrase is be witnesses. Now, now, now notice he says be witnesses. Witnessing is not just something that we do. Witnesses are who we are. The main word, the Greek word is martyreo. Say martyreo. And we get the word, what word do we get from it? Martyr. What is a martyr? A martyr is someone who believes something to the point where they're willing to lay down their life for it. And he says, we are martyreo. We are witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, this text uh, uh, tells us that we are called to be witnesses. Come on, help me preach this. Uh, uh, Look at your neighbor, say neighbor. If every Christian lived just like me, what kind of Christian would every Christian be? Mm -hmm. See, there are some things... (laughs) There are some things that are inconsistent with being a Christian, you know, um, we have what we call uh, Freestyle Friday at our church. And it's hip hop church. And so on Friday nights, uh, our young people come together and, and they do, you know, uh, 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 Christian rap and uh, they have spoken word and uh, all that kind of stuff. And so I go and when I go, I try to dress like the young people. Uh, so, you know, I, I wear an oversized uh, shirt. And uh, I wear my jeans, but I, I have them around my waist, not, <laughs> not pants on the ground, pants on the ground. Uh, and then I have a Kango cap. I got it right there. Throw my Kango cap. So that some people are challenged uh, colloquially. And it, this, is, this is called a Kango cap. Throw it to me. Throw it to me. So I wear my Kango cap, and I'm old school into his house, and uh, I wear my Kango cap like that. <laughs> Amen. With the Kango showing. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. I got to get your name, too, because as we were singing together, I said, finally, I found somebody that sings as bad as I do. (laughs) Amen. I found my crowd, man. And and so I go to Freestyle Friday, and I have my Timbos on. Those are the work boots. And so I have my Timbos on, have my, have my oversized and, you know, everything. So I, I, I diddy bop on in, you know, with the kids and they get me to do something, you know, and I'll, I'll always come up with some old tired rap or something, you know, and uh, they, they, they'll just say, oh, go pastor, go pastor, because I relate to them. Well, I'm leaving and my wife calls me and says, pick up some milk. So I stop at the all night store. As I'm going in, uh, the, the, the security guard steps in my way. And I say, oh, excuse me, excuse me. And then uh, I, I move over, he moves over. And, I, and I'm looking at him like, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to give you a ticket. I said, a ticket? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? And I'm thinking to myself, you can't give me a ticket. You're not a real cop. <laughs> and so he says, come outside. So I go outside the parking lot, and there is a vintage 1963 Cadillac convertible. Beautiful. And he says, see that? I said, yeah. He said, they call me the king of the Cadillac Club. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, I see why. He said, everything's original. Really? Wow. I said, that's worth some money. He said, yes, it is, but I'd never sell it. And so he said, that's why I'm giving you a ticket. 
I said, wait a minute, what, what do you mean? That's why you give me a ticket. He said, because you drove up in a Cadillac. Okay. He said, but you're dressed like one of them hippie hoppers. <laughs> and he said, what you're driving is inconsistent with what you're wearing. I got to give you a ticket. I wrote it down. I said, that's a good sermon illustration uh, because some things are inconsistent with being a Christian and we ought to give out a ticket to Christians who try to do both and and not either or. Uh, okay, if you agree with me, just whenever I say uh, uh, and, and I say it and it's something that somebody who says they're a Christian needs to get a ticket, you just say, give them a ticket. <laughs> Practice. Okay, calling on God and calling 900 numbers. Living for Jesus and living together. Mm -hmm. uh, committed to Christ and cussing out your husband. Uh -huh. Christ and crack. Worship and weed. Intercessory prayer and internet pornography. Yeah, blessing God and beating your wife. Yeah, Holy Spirit and the Jack Daniel spirit. Uh-huh. Yeah, telling the gospel and spreading the gossip. Yeah, yeah. The sign of the cross and the zodiac sign. Biblical counseling and Oprah Winfrey. Yes. Give him a ticket. And so here, this text is tailored to teach this timeless truth. That God has empowered us that he may employ us to evangelize everywhere. Let me back that up. I like the way that sounds. This text is tailored to teach this timeless truth that God has empowered us that he may employ us to evangelize everywhere. Let's look at the text. When we see this text, and I told you I'm going to drop them, I'm not going to push them. Uh, be, be when you look at it, the first thing he tells us is this. He tells us about the priority of being a witness. Look at your Bible. Here's what it says. Here's the first word in, in my Bible. But, stop, stop. This tells us it's a priority. Now, how so, Pastor Ford? Well, I'm glad you asked. You asked intelligent questions. Because but is a conjunction and, and remember, anybody old school, 1983, Schoolhouse Rock, conjunction, junction, what's your function? The function of a conjunction is to tie two phrases together. So, but is a coordinating conjunction that contrasts. Now, what does that mean? Here's what it means. Whatever comes before the but is canceled out by what comes after the but. You get it? Now, what comes before? Look at the text. In verse 7, the disciples are saying, uh, uh, Lord, will you restore the kingdom at this time? Can we sit on your left hand and your right hand? And so he cancels it out. See, here's what he's telling them. He's saying, listen, listen, you need to understand uh, that verse 7, get out of the video. Verse 6 and 7 is canceled out by verse 8. So what's he saying? Here's what he's saying. Bottom line. They're saying, we want to rule and reign. And Jesus says, cancel that out. You have the wrong priority. This is not time to rule and to reign. This is not the time for Benzes and Bugattis and Blings and Benjamin. No, this is the time that you need to make sharing me a priority. He says, you got the wrong priority. And so he gets them out of the video. He, he says, quit trying to find out what flavor my Kool-Aid is. This is what your priority ought to be. You ought to be focusing on witnessing. Can I ask you a question? Say, ask it. Ask it. Is being a witness your first response or your last resort? Hmm. Is there anything better than going to heaven? Answer me. Yes. Taking somebody else with you. And so here now is the priority. Uh, someone has well said uh, that there are five gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the one that we're writing. Some people will never read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but what is the gospel according to you? The Bible says we ought to let our light so shine before men that they would see our good works and glorify our Father who art in heaven. I, I'm on Moody Network, 
and uh, I'm, a, I'm a former professor at the Moody Bible Institute in the city of Chicago. And, um, and uh, uh, Moody was uh, interviewing this nurse. Uh, she worked at University of Chicago, and uh, she had won in two years almost her entire shift on her entire floor except for about three people. And so Moody interviewed her, and they said, wow, this is tremendous. There's almost 100 people that she's personally led to faith in Christ. And get what she says. Now they're interviewing on the radio. And uh, she says, uh, they, they say, and so only three people that you know of, only three that I know of unless they're new. Wow, what a nurse, what a nurse. And, and, and how long have you been? She said, wait, 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 wait. You got that wrong. He said, wait a minute. What do you mean I got it wrong? She said, I'm not a nurse. He said, wait, wait. You told me and you've been telling us you're a nurse and that you want all these people. Yes, I want all those people. Yes, I work on that floor, but I'm not a nurse. He said, okay, then tell us what you are. I wrote it down. This is good stuff. She said, I'm a Christian disguised as a nurse. She had her priorities straight. She understood. People ask me all, all, the, all the time. They, they, say, they, they, say, they, they say, never mind. Let me just read, read, what, read what one pastor said. Let me show you his priority. This is a young African pastor. He did this like maybe 20 years ago I got this, uh, but I use it all the time. Here's what he says. Here's his commitment. He says, my commitment as a Christian to the person of Jesus Christ to evangelize and share the good news everywhere. Listen to this. He says, I have Holy Spirit power. The decision has been made. I must go till he comes and work till he stops me. I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of him. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, colorless dreams, tame vision, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guides reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the, of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Christ. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problems recognizing me. My banner will be clear. The priority of being, secondly, secondly, not just the priority of being a Christian, uh, of being a witness for Christ. Notice, secondly, the power for being a witness for Christ. It says, he says, you, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, we, we know what's going on here. There's a dispensational truth here uh, that, that we all recognize uh, that the, the uh, Holy Spirit, John 5, 39, wasn't given yet because Jesus Christ had not yet been glorified, which means then he had not been dead, buried, resurrected, uh, ascended, and seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's going to send them as the ascension gift. Your pastor is going to tell you all that theology. And uh, when you look at it now, he, he's telling them, listen, you have power. Now, there's two different words. In verse 7, there's a word translated power. In verse 8, there's a word translated power. 
The word in verse 7, and, you know, I'm not going to give you too many Greek words tonight because my cousin, when I, when I graduated from Sim, you know, most of my sermons were filled with Greek and Hebrew, and my cousin came up to, to talk to me. She said, cuz, let me tell you something. Greek and Hebrew is like your underwear. You use it for support, but you don't go around showing it to everybody. <laughs> uh, so the first word is egousia. Say egousia. And then the second word in verse 8 is dunamis. I know you're familiar with it. And egousia is rightly, rightful designated authority. Dunamis is implosive and explosive power. And so here now, he's letting us know uh, that we have to have uh, uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit for power. So in our dispensation of grace, it's called the filling of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Let me show you something real quick. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Let me show you how pivotal uh, that is in the life of the believer. Uh, so, in, in the book of Ephesians, remember Paul breaks his stuff down so easy uh, to break down, even though it's difficult to understand. Uh, he, he talks about, first of all, our walk in, I mean, our, our wealth in Christ. Uh, then, that's chapters 1 through 3. Then he begins to talk about our walk in Christ, chapter 4, verse 1 uh, to 6, verse 9. Then he talks about our warfare in Christ. So then, in the first section, our belief. Then the second section, our behavior. And then the third, our battle, or our creed our conduct and our conflict. And so now the key that's pivotal to the whole thing uh, is uh, verse 18, be not drunk with wine. Now he's going to talk about uh, the presidency of the Holy Spirit in our life, and he's going to show us that's the key to living the Christian life, that we can't live effectively if we are not filled with the Spirit of God. So notice what it says in verse 19. Verse 19, uh, so verse 18, we're filled with the Spirit. Verse 19, being filled with the Spirit then, gives us the ability uh, to be able uh, to worship God the way God wants us to worship. Verse 20 gives us the ability to pray the way God wants us to pray. Verse 21 gives us unity in the church. Uh, verse 22 through 24 helps a wife submit to her husband. 25 through 33, a husband being able to love his wife. Uh, verses 1 through 3, children uh, honoring and obeying their parents. Uh, verse 4, parents uh, uh, raising up their children the way God wants them to. 5 through 9, um, uh, employer-employee relationships, 10 through the end of the chapter, can't de defeat the devil. See, everything is based on the power that God has given to us. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Ask me how filled. We should be so filled that if a mosquito flew in here and bit one of us, he flowed singing, there's power in the blood. And so here he, he says, we have, now is there a difference? Yes. It, whenever you re receive Christ, you have the residency of the Holy Spirit. So he is in every believer. Uh, but what he's talking about here is the presidency of the Holy Spirit. You say, what's the difference? Okay, let me see if I can get you to understand. See, in the residency of the Spirit, you get the Spirit. But in the presidency of the Spirit, the Spirit gets you. In the residency of the Spirit, you're converted. But in the presidency of the Spirit, you're committed. In the residency of the Spirit, it prepares you to live in heaven. In the presidency of the Spirit, it, it enables you to live on earth. In the residency of the Spirit, you you surrender your soul. But in the presidency of the Spirit, you surrender your life. So then, in the residency of the Spirit, uh, you experience God's pardon. But in the presidency of the Holy Spirit, you execute God's plan. So then, it's the difference between salvation and discipleship. So I put it up. I'm not going to go through it uh, but real quick, but how do you feel? How are you, how are you filled with the Spirit? Uh, let me give you four C's real quick. Uh, what do you do, Pastor Ford? Here's what I do. I use these four C's all the time. Uh, number one, I confess my sins. First John 1 John 1.9. I confess my sins. That's the first C. Then the second C is I commit myself to the lordship of Christ in my body. Uh, that's 
Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your... Re then the third C is I conform to the word, the will, and the way of God. That's Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then the fourth C, I claim it by faith. How did you begin the Christian walk, Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, 1 through 3. O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you from the truth which evidently have been set forth in Christ Jesus, have begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? He's saying, L listen, you, you, you can't, you can't uh, flesh up commitment. No, it has to be in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it's a promised power. Oh, well, here, here's the evidence. Character, conduct conversation, and converts. That's the evidence. So, uh, so when you look at what's going on here, he says it's all about the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, I have nine grandkids. And um, when I only had six, uh, we live right, uh, right on the drive called the Outer Drive. And so uh, my wife said, well, let's take them to Navy Pier. And so we jumped in the hoopty, hoopty and we took our six grandkids to the Navy Pier. We got there about lunchtime, and uh, we were looking to have a good time. So we got there about lunchtime, and uh, said, so where you want to eat, kids? Bubba Gumps. Okay, we go to Bubba Gumps and get scrimps. And uh, so we, we leave. We go to IMAX, and I don't know if anybody's ever been in an IMAX theater where the whole ceiling is the movie, and you lean back. Man, that thing is fascinating. It's just off the chain. When the words of that great theologian, Snoop Dogg is off the hizzle for zizzle my nizzle. <laughs> and so then afterward, we went to the Ferris wheel. They rode the Ferris wheel. That, now it's dinner time. Where do you want to eat? Uh, we want to go to Bubba Gump's. So we go there afterward. Uh, I'm saying to myself, okay, I have $56 left. And uh, it's Friday. I don't get paid till Sunday. So, whoo, I got to hold on to this. We go outside and there's a guy. He's got all these little glow worm things, you know. And so... Uh, uh, the kids see it, they run toward him. He's a good salesman. He wraps them around him everywhere. And they say, can we get one, Pat Paul? And I got $56. And you're supposed to last me for two days. And I said, no, 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 no. Can't have one. We, let's, let's go to the car. It's time to go home. And then my wife, you know, talking about, oh, baby, come on. <laughs> get them one. It'll be the icing on the cake for the day. I'm thinking, it's the icing on their cake. It's the icing off of my cake. I only have $56. So I said, all right, all right. How much do they cost? He said, six bucks. I said, six bucks. He said, yeah, a piece. And so I said, okay, one, 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 one a piece. That's $36. And uh, so, you know, little Jay's talking about, can I get two? No. <laughs> so the guy says, get them two. I said, you want to give them one? Is it buy one, get one free? He said, no. I said, okay, then give them one each. So then my wife, you know, I'm thinking, you know, $56. I just spent 36. I got 20 bucks left. My wife comes talking about, I want one. <laughs> I said, all right, all right. So, she, so now I'm out of 42 bucks. I'm thinking to myself, they're all going to be glowing as we go down the out. And I'm not. So I got myself one too. <laughs> so we're on the way down home and little Jay says, that's my oldest grandson, he says, these things are going out, Papa. And I'm thinking, I ain't always been saved. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to go back and light this guy up. <laughs> but then I remember he gave me a little piece of paper and I said, oh, I can make him glow again. Don't worry about it. And so uh, little Jay said, you can make him glow again? Oh, come on. No, you can't, Papa. And then Jazzy, before I could say anything, she was my youngest granddaughter. She said, my Papa said he can make him glow again. And my Papa said he can make him glow again. He can make him glow again because my Papa can do what my Papa say he can do. Ain't that right, Papa? <laughs> I looked at my wife. I said, are you listening? <laughs> so we got home. I took all eight of them. I went in the room, I followed the instructions, I came back a half hour later, I said, look, they're all glowing again, and little Jay said, I'm not believing this, and Jazzy, before I could finish my sentence, said, I told you my papa can do what my papa say he can do, because my papa can do everything my papa say he can do, ain't that right, papa? <laughs> I looked at my wife and I said, do you hear what she's saying? Because the Bible says, out of the mouth of babes, thou hast perfected praise. <laughs> now, what did they say? 
so I can move on and get you out of here. Uh, what did they say? Here's what the, each piece of paper said, paraphrase. These glow worms do not possess their own light. They have a substance put in them by the manufacturer that is luminous, lum, luminous. And when you find a primary source of light, wrap them around it, leave them there for 30 to 40 minutes, they will glow again. And I thought, that's the problem with our power. We're not in fellowship with the light, John 8, 12, the light of the world. And so when our light goes out, not if our light goes out, we've got to have fellowship with him, Bible study and prayer and all of the things that he's designed that would draw us closer to him. I wonder, do we realize that Jesus Christ doesn't shack, that he's not looking for a girlfriend, that he wants a bride. He's not looking for a one-day stand or a two-day stand. He's looking for a permanent commitment. And so I said, man, that's powerful that there's something inside of this thing that was not put inside of it by it, but somebody who manufactured it put this stuff in it that would give it power to shine in the darkness. That's you. That's me. And I don't know about you. I want to let my light so shine before men that they will see my good works and glorify my Father who is in heaven. And I don't want to be any old kind of light bulb. I want to be a three-way light bulb. I want to shine for the Father, shine for the Son, shine for the Holy Ghost, blessed three in one. And so, and so, here's the last two, here's the last two. Notice the priority of being a witness for Jesus Christ. Notice the power for being, now notice the point of being a witness for Jesus Christ. Now, it's, it reads a little different in the NIV and the modern versions. It'll say, for me. Uh, my Bible says, unto me. And, and, and you know, we're not going to make a big deal out of that. I mean, you know, if, if you want to use the nearly inspired version, you go right ahead with it. You know, if God can forgive you for it, so can I. Amen. I'm just teasing. <laughs> and, and so when, when, you, when you look at this unto me, I have a question. Is it unto me or is it unto me? Let me say it again because that went right over somebody's head. Is the emphasis of the text unto me or unto me? Now, what difference does it make? Well, you see it on the notes. If it is unto me, it means whatever we do as we witness, it must be pleasing to him. But if it's unto me, it's pointing to him. No, I don't know whether it's either or. Uh, I was talking about emphasis with, with uh, my assistant pastor, and uh, we were talking about vase. Do you pronounce it vase or do you pronounce it vase? And so I looked up my good friend Webster. He said, you could do it either way. You could pronounce it vase and you could pronounce it vase. But his wife cleared it up. She said, no, don't listen to him. Listen to me. She said, if you buy it from Target, it's a vase. <laughs> If you buy it from Neiman Marcus, it's a vase. <laughs> you say, what's the point? Well, you must always put the emphasis on the right syllable, right? <laughs> Am I right? And so what's it? So if he says, if it's, if it's pleasing to him, that we have to make sure that God is pleased with our witness, verbal and nonverbal. Because, you know, we ought to witness every day and sometimes we ought to use words, right? And, and so here it is now. Here it is. We begin to look at it with pleasing to him. I heard a story that illustrates so I'm going to drop it and move on. That this uh, young man was uh, doing a, a, a violin uh, solo uh, concert uh, at Carnegie Hall, and uh, he got a standing ovation. And everybody kept telling him, they're giving you a standing ovation, bow, bow. But he refused to bow. He refused to bow. And they kept clapping, they kept clapping, and he refused to bow. Suddenly he took his violin, put it on his arm, and then he bowed to acknowledge. And everybody was glad, they were tired of clapping. <laughs> And they all sat down. When he got backstage, one of the stagehands said, those people clapped for almost five minutes and you didn't bow. Why? He said, because you don't know. Up in the balcony was the man who taught me. 
I was waiting for him to clap. You see, what they did didn't mean a thing to me. It was the master that I wanted to please. How about you today? Is it the master that you want to please? Yeah, everybody else is giving accolades. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And we have the option of getting five crowns. I hope that you'll get all five of them because that means you got the applause of the master. Well done, thou good and faithful servants. Then uh, it could be pointing to him. I don't think it's either or. I think it's both and. And whenever you look at this, what do you mean pointing to him? I, I, I like this. I like this. Because uh, think about it. Vanna White makes almost two million dollars a year doing two things. Looking good and pointing. <laughs> think about that. Isn't that our job description? We ought to look good. Why? Because when we look good, he looks good. That's what he says. He says, he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We live holy for his name's sake. Because if we don't, we don't want people saying, we want people saying, what a Christian. We don't want them saying, what? A Christian? <laughs> and so we ought to be pleasing to him. It is amazing. I, I, I do this little thing. I call it, I call it uh, soap opera gospel. And uh, they invited me to go to the women's prison. They said they have 400 women, and uh, we want you to come preach to them. I said, fine. They said, but you have to come early. I said, well, I usually try to get everywhere I go early. And they said, well, no, you got to come early because we give you a 10-minute segment with these women because we don't have enough guards. If they don't like what you're saying or they don't like your preaching, they walk out. And so we let the preacher come first, tell them what he's going to talk about. Then those who don't want to hear it won't come. And I said, okay. So I prayed that night. I said, Lord, give me something that would attract these women, that would get them, and I could point to Jesus Christ, and they'll come back. So God gave me what I call the soap opera gospel. Here it is. I'll underline for those of you who are soap opera title challenged. As the world turns, everybody develops a love of life. And even though you may be facing your own private secret storm, standing on the edge of night, I want you to know these are only the days of our lives. And so that you don't become one of the young and the restless and end up in general hospital, being taken care of by the doctors, look up and receive Jesus Christ because he was dead, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scripture. He is the guiding light. And if you accept him as your personal savior, he will allow you to share in his dynasty. And one day, the shout will come, and Christ will come in the air, and he will take us to another world. And when we get there, we'll all be around the throne, and God will stand up, look at all of us, and say, these are all my children. Yeah. Guess what happened, my singing friend? 400 women came to hear the message. Amen. Amen. 23 conversions. And afterward, the head of the, 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 the sheriff's uh, guards there said, pr pr Preacher, we have never had all the women come back. I said, well, praise the Lord for that. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the souls that got saved. He said, yeah, well, the guards told me to ask you. Since you had such a control over these women, do you want a job? <laughs> Say, no way. Uh -uh. No, I, I, I already got the job. Amen. It's the highest job. You remember what Billy Graham said? He said, uh, I'm serving the Lord. I would not stoop to be a king or a president. Amen. And so... Here's what it says, pleasing to him, Colossians 3.17. And whatsoever you do in word and deed, do some. Do most. All. Now, what's all mean? I'm about to turn you into Christ Bible Church. When I say what's all mean, here's what they say back to me. All means all. That's all all means. What does all mean? All means all. That's all all means. That's right. That's right. And so everything. We are supposed to do. Here it is, last one. You've been so gracious to me. 
the places for us to be witnesses. So then we see the priority of being a witness for Christ. We see the power for being witnesses for Christ, the point of being witnesses for Christ. Now look at this last one, the places to be witnesses for Christ in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Wow. Now get this. This not only tells us where to witness, this is the outline for the book. Because in chapters 1 through 7, they're witnessing in Jerusalem. In chapters 8 through 12, they're in Judea and Samaria. And then in 13 through 28, they're at the uttermost parts of the earth. I, I like this, concentric circles. And I want you to think about this. Like I said, I'm not going to push them. I'm just going to drop them. But listen, think about this. What did it mean to the disciples when he said this? What was Jerusalem? The place of their greatest failure. Because it was in Jerusalem, Mark 12, 50, uh, that they all forsook him and fled. It was in Jerusalem that, that Peter denied him. Remember, uh, uh, Peter was a, a, a switchblade-carrying, cussing Christian. He was. Yeah, he carried a switchblade. Remember, he cut off Malchus's ear. And then he denied Christ with a curse and a cuss. And so he denied him there. They failed. He says, go back to Jerusalem, the place of your greatest failure. And for most of us, we know where it is, home. <laughs> home. But then what about Judea, the place of their greatest conflict? Because it was there uh, that Peter uh, left ministry and went back to fishing. And he took eight other disciples with him. There's a conflict that they had because of the problems now Jesus is gone. What are we going to do? And so go back to Judea, the place of your greatest conflict. But then what about Samaria, the place of their greatest prejudice? Because the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. So what they would do is rather than go through, straight through, which, took, which would take them one day, they would go around Perea when they're going from Galilee to Judea. They'd rather add a half a day on the journey rather than go through Samaria. And Jesus tells them, now go to the place of your greatest prejudice. You know what? I wish I had time to share my testimony. But I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, when, I, when I got saved, let me see if I can remember. <laughs> Uh, uh, I got saved in uh, 1974, uh, be, uh, uh, September 29, 1974, uh, between 11.30 p.m., 12 o'clock a.m., 7372 Formosa Way, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 15208. I was on the right side of the bed, the side closest to the alley. I vaguely remember my conversion. <laughs> And the guy who led me to Christ, at that time, there was only two things wrong with him. One, he was white. Two, he was southern white, y'all. <laughs> and I, tell, I used to tell people all the time, facetiously, I'm so racist, I will not eat white rice. <laughs> I'm so racist, I won't take aspirin because you had to pick cotton before you got to the aspirin. <laughs> and God says, oh, you don't like white, huh? And so who led me to Christ? Ray Reno. He, well, he says Ray Reno, but it, he, it's spelled R-E-N-O. Ray Reno. I keep telling them, Ray Reno. Your name's not Ray Reno. Ray <laughs> Reno. And, uh, and it's amazing to me that, that, that God used him uh, and, and, and he did some dramatic things. The, the man saved my life uh, on the job. And uh, I listened to the gospel for the first time. And uh, this man led me to Christ. And even now, I've been a Christian for, four, for 41 years, uh, this October. And uh, we still, we, I just talked to him last week. He's been with me every leg of the journey. I got to tell you this real quick. See, I grew up without a father. I grew up in a small home, small family, 10, 10, 10 kids, nine boys, one tomboy, never had a father. I asked my mom what, what my father ever do for me. She said, boy, he gave you your, his last name and a, and a 10 cent can of milk. That's all he ever did for you. And the closest I've ever had to a father is Ray Reno. He's 10 years older than me, and we love each other, and he tells everybody, this is my son in the gospel, and this is my adopted son. And uh, it's amazing to me how God, so, so you don't like black people, better watch out. <laughs> he said, go to, and then what, the uttermost part, go to the place of your greatest uncertainty. 
What, what's going on? Here you have, uh, you have this baby church uh, in an incubator, just born on the day of Pentecost. And look at the world. You have a Rome-dominated world militarily, and the Pax Romana. It was called the Roman peace, and uh, they controlled. And the, and the thing that was good for Christianity is that the Romans believed in domination without assimilation. You could keep your culture, your gods, and everything as long as you declare Caesar was Lord. And of course, we would never do that. But here you have the, this, this Rome-dominated world militarily. How did Paul preach the gospel so readily? Because Rome built roads and put garrisons to protect their, their, their empire. And so the gospel was able to freely go. Paul walked on those roads, told the gospel. And then you had a Greek-dominated world philosophically. Uh, Alexander the Great wanted to, to dominate the whole world and give it two things, the Greek language and Greek philosophy. And he did both of those things by the time he was 33. Isn't it paradoxical, ironic, that a man who conquered the world died of alcoholism because he couldn't conquer his own soul? Then you had Jewish synagogues dotted all over the place. And he says, now go into this place of uncertainty and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Wow. You've been so gracious to me, and and uh, and uh, I'm I'm early. I'm, I'm a few minutes early. Praise the Lord. And uh, uh, but let me tell you, uh, you know I like ESPN classics, and I was watching it, and they had on there the 1969 NBA championship. Uh, remember New York Knicks and uh, Jerry West and uh, Wilt Chamberlain and Willis Reed, yeah, and uh, and Walt Frazier. So. It was six, six, I mean, uh, it was uh, three games apiece come down to the playoff. Now, Friday, Willis Reed went down with an injury. And the announcer said, oh, oh, game seven is in jeopardy uh, for the Knicks because the big man is down. And, uh, you know, all that weekend, that's all they were talking about. That's all they were talking about. I remember because I was, I was a, bless you, I was a, a, a high school senior. And... Uh, Sunday came. Both teams came out. Jerry Wilson, Wilt, they said they don't have a chance. The big man didn't come. While baby Frazier was giving the high five and everything and telling them, come on, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Before they started, the announcer said, wait, what's that? Wait a minute. Turn the light over to the tunnel. And they put the light on the tunnel. Here comes Willis Reed. He's limping. He's, he's got some of, the, some of the residuals of having gone down on Friday. And then Walt Baby Love dapped him up, then dapped everybody again and said something. Well, you know, they won. They won by three points. And uh, it was because of uh, the big man on, on, on the court. So the announcer said to Walt Frazier, what did you say? I saw you do the dap again. What did you say? He said, I went and said, it's in the bag. The big man is back. It's in the bag. The big man is back. It's in the bag. The big man was back. I came to tell you, look, we can be witnesses. You want to know why? Because the big man is back. Because one dark Friday, he went down. Because he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. But as the old black preacher would say, early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. And he has assured us that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, that we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so now I'm telling all of us, reminding us that we are to be witnesses, to share the word of God to say to the Lord Jesus Christ give me hell a half a glass of ice water and a water pistol and I'll put it out for you Lord <laughs> father bless the truth to our hearts we pray for Christ's sake while every head is bowed and every eye is closed I want to challenge you today you may be here today and you don't know Jesus Christ in the pardon of your sins we like to present him to you what is the gospel first Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 and 4 for I delivered unto you that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures we want to invite you to come is there anyone is there anyone you just come to the front just come to the front very quickly would you come if you don't know him in the pardon of your sin but you'd like to we invite you to come to the front is there anyone, is there anyone you'd like to come to the front? Now we're talking about 
becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, we're, 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 we're not talking about just going down in some water or something, you know, because under the water is not under the blood. But we invite you to come. Is there anyone? You can't be a witness for Jesus until you know him. Maybe you're here tonight, and you would say, you know, I got that residency thing. I don't have that presidency thing. I'm not filled with the Spirit of God. Well, I just shared with you how to do that. Just confess your sin, claim it by faith, conform to the Word of God. But maybe you'd like someone to pray with you. We have counselors who stand ready. Would you come? Yes, I, I want to be totally dominated, controlled by the Lord. Some things in my life I, I want dealt with. We invite you to come. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Make your way to the front. Let somebody pray with you. Maybe you're struggling with some things. And you say, I just need uh, the Lord to intervene. We invite you. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Maybe you're here and you're visiting. You're not a member of chapel, but you like to become. There are those, there are those who stand ready to share with you how you become a member of this local assembly uh, to lead you through their membership process and tell you how you can become a member here. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Amen. God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Oh, yes, you could. Some, someone will, will be coming. Amen. How are you? God bless you. What's your name? Shania. Shania. All right. Amen. Amen. And you made a good choice. Um, can I get a uh, some, someone to help her with uh, membership? Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. How many of you will take the challenge? Lord, I know that you've given this revelation and illumination for demonstration and application. So, I want to raise up some frangelists. What do you mean, frangelists? I thought it was evangelists. No, friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. Frangelists. Not original with me, but we use it at our church. So, how many of you have friends that you've not shared the gospel with yet? Let me see your hands. How many of you have relatives that you haven't shared the gospel with yet? How many have associates? How many have neighbors? Here's what I'd like you to do. Now, here's, what, here's what, one of the things we do in our assembly. I don't know if it'd be appropriate or not. We do cell phone evangelism. So twice a month, second and fourth, I tell everybody, break out your phones. Who is it that you like to tell about Jesus Christ? Tell them now. Tell them now. So all of these avenues, put it on your Facebook. Witness to all your Facebook friends. Get you some gospel tracks. Uh, you know, here's, here's the prayer, and I'm done. I mean, here's the challenge, then the prayer, then I'm done. Here's the challenge. How many of you will say, as God leads me, I am going to to witness to somebody tomorrow. I'm praying, Lord, lead someone to me that I can tell the good news of Jesus Christ. How many of you will take the challenge? Amen. Father God, we thank you and praise you for our time together tonight. Bless this assembly. Bless Pastor Derek as he's away. Keep him safe. Give him journey mercies and arriving grace. Thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you for this great great band, this great praise team that led us, as it were, into the third heaven that we were actually gathered around your throne. And we thank you for what you're going to do as we marinate on our worship and as we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us, to guard us, to govern us, to grace us, and to grow us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.